Let's investigate the canonical commutation relation. This is one of the deepest ideas in quantum mechanics. But before we try and understand it, we need to define the commutator. So let's take two arbitrary operators and call them A and B. We have to put little hats on top because hats denote operators in quantum mechanics. This square bracket notation over here is the commutator. And the commutator is defined as follows. What we have to do is if we take the commutator of A and B, we first do AB and then we subtract off BA. What does this mean? Every time we have an operator in quantum mechanics, that operator has to act on something. So it can act on a function, it can act on a state. So these operators over here are all going to be acting on some uh, function. I'm just going to call the dummy function in this video. So what does this part actually mean? This means we apply B first, and then we apply A. And this version over here means that we apply A first, and then B. So we swap the order in which we apply the operators. And then we take the difference between those guys. And if there is something that results from this difference, that means that we have non-commuting operators. But if this turns out to be 0, then the commutator is zero. So those are commuting operators. We're going to find that position and momentum do not commute. So position and momentum, when we put them into uh, this kind of definition, we're going to see that we actually get something as a result that's non-zero. So I want to show you a very interesting property before we move on to that. So let's have a look at this property. What can I do to this? I can actually swap the order of these guys if I uh, factor out a minus sign. So we'll do that over here. So if I factor out a minus sign, what's going to happen? Well, I can put this guy in the front because it's going to turn into a positive uh, BA. So I'm going to have BA, and I need to put hats on top because these guys are operators, and then I'm going to have AB. I'm going to subtract that off. AB. And what I've done over here is I've essentially swapped the order of this commutator but I've introduced a minus sign. And using this definition over here, I can write this in a more compact notation. I can write this as minus the square bracket of B and A. So have a look at this relationship. This relationship is called anti-symmetry. So if there was symmetry, then swapping the order of these guys would not result in any sign change. It would just be the same. If, if the commutator was a symmetric uh, relationship, then AB would actually be the same as BA. But it's not. There is a minus sign that gets introduced. And the reason a minus sign gets introduced is because of this relationship over here. If you factor out a minus sign, that results in the swapping. There's also uh, a similar uh, kind of relationship you can define, and that's called the anti-commutator. And that has a plus sign instead of a minus sign. But we're not going to discuss that in this video. So now what I want to do is I want to uh, take a specific example. I want to set A and B uh, equal to the position and momentum operators. So this holds true for any operator. And in this general form, A and B could actually commute. They could, this combination could be equal to zero. And if it is equal to zero, then those guys are called compatible operators. And those are actually uh, also called compatible observables. And we'll get to that in a later video in this playlist. So now let's put in position and momentum. So we'll do that in blue. Let's have a look at what happens if we put x with a hat, that's the position operator, and p with a little hat. And this, for now, I'm just going to have a look at 1D motion. And we'll generalize this to 3D uh, after we've done this little derivation. But first, we have to look at one dimensional cases. So x is just the x position, let's say along the x axis, and p is the x momentum. What I could do is I could put a subscript x over here. I could say this is the momentum in the x direction. But that's unnecessary because for this uh, combination over here, we're just dealing with a single one dimensional uh, degree of freedom. So we just have 1D motion, and it's a particle, let's say it's a particle that lives in some potential, and it's just moving along one direction, and that is the x axis. So we have to apply this, because these guys are operators. Operators always have to act on something. We have to apply this to some uh, dummy function or some test function. 
I can call that test function phi of x. I'm going to call it phi of x. And we're going to act with this combination over here on to this function. And this function only depends on x. So let's have a look at what happens. So we're going to use this definition, and we're going to act on, on uh, this function with this definition. So that's going to be equal to, first we're going to have x, and then we're going to have p, and that's going to act on phi. And uh, in, in this derivation, I'm just going to omit uh, this little bracket x, because we know this is just a function of x, so it's a bit redundant to write it every single time. And then we're going to subtract off the reversed order of these guys. So because this is xp, we have to have xp and then px. So we're going to have p, and then we're going to have x acting on phi. So let's have a look at what happens over here. This is telling us that we have to act on with the momentum operator first. So I'm going to put brackets over here. So first we have to act with the momentum operator and then with the position operator. What about over here? Over here we have the momentum operator and then the position operator. So we have to act with the position operator first, I'll put some brackets around here, and then the momentum operator. So that is what this uh, commutator is telling us to do. So now what I'm going to do is uh, we're assuming that we're working in the position representation. And in the position representation, the position operator is the same as multiplying by x. So this x hat is just the same as multiplying by x. And what about p? Well, p is the same as taking a derivative. And I'll write these definitions out uh, on the side over here. So this guy over here, x, actually I'll write it in the top, x with a little hat on top, that is the same, we'll just write three bars over here, that is the, defined as x. So we're just multiplying by x. And what about momentum? Well, momentum with a little p hat, that is defined to be h bar over i, or you could also treat this as minus i, because dividing by i is the same as minus i. And we're going to have d dx. So this is a derivative with respect to x. Now keep in mind that I'm using a total derivative over here. Now usually, if you have other uh, other variables which you're differentiating with respect to, you're going to want to use a partial derivative. But because the only derivatives we're going to be doing in this derivation are going to be with respect to x, we don't have to uh, include the partial derivative notation. So that's just a subtle point. Sometimes you're going to see partial derivatives. That's because you're also going to have uh, derivatives with respect to x, y, and z. And you also might have time derivatives. But here we have no time derivatives. There's no dependence on time. So these guys are our definitions. This is how we're defining the position operator, and this is how we're defining the momentum operator. So these guys are only valid in the position representation. There is also an alternative representation which we can also pick. That would be, uh, the, that would be the momentum representation. So you could work in terms of momentum. And then these guys would actually get swapped over. So over here would be the same as multiplying by p, and over here we would have a derivative. We'd have a momentum derivative but the sign would be a little bit different. So we're going to get to the uh, position representation as well in a later video. But now let's use, uh, actually the momentum representation. Let's use the position representation in this video to complete this derivation. So let's complete this derivation. What do we have to do? We have to unpack what all of these guys mean. So I'll write it underneath. Over here, this is the same as multiplying by x. And what's in the brackets? Well, in the brackets, we're going to have h bar on i, and then we're going to take the derivative with respect to x of phi. So that's what we have in the brackets over here. You can see that definition, that is just what we've defined the momentum operator to be. So we have this factor of h bar on i, and we're going to use that factor of h bar on i uh, in, a little bit later over here, and we're going to factor it out. So the important key difference over here is that we're taking the derivative with respect to x first, and then we're multiplying by x. Now let's have a look at this part. We're going to subtract off what is happening over here. Well, we're going to have h bar and i again. That's h bar and i. And then we're going to have the derivative. That's a derivative with respect to x. And in the brackets, we're going to have x times phi. So here's the key difference. We are differentiating after we multiply by x. That's the opposite of what we have over here. So that is the key difference between these two terms. But you can see they have something in common. 
they both have an h bar and i. And h bar and i, that is just a constant. So we can move that constant around. The, the constant is commutative with uh, multiplying by x, and it's also commutative with the derivative. So you could actually move it inside the derivative. But we don't want to do that. We want to factor it out as a common factor. So let's do that. So we have h bar on i. So isn't that nice? Uh, constants are commutative. But operators, in general, are not commutative. And that is actually where a lot of these uh, elegant ideas in quantum mechanics come from. It's the idea that operators don't necessarily commute. So that's a very deep idea in quantum mechanics. So now let's expand this out. So we have h bar and i. That's our common factor. Over here, we're just going to have x times the derivative. We're going to have this derivative of phi with respect to x. And what's going to happen over here? Well. We've factored out this h bar and i, and we have a product. So let's use the product rule for differentiation to expand this out. So what is that going to look like? We're still going to have this minus sign. So we're going to have a minus sign over here. Now, let's take the derivative with respect to phi first and leave x as a constant. So we'll just leave x, and this is going to give us x, and then we're going to have a derivative of phi with respect to x. So we have just left x alone, and we've just differentiated phi. Now let's take the other term. The other term is going to be the derivative of x with respect to x. And dx dx, well, that's just equal to 1. So if this is just equal to 1, that's just going to leave phi. And phi is going to be over here with a minus sign. I'll close the brackets. So just as a little recap, what I did for these two terms, these guys are just the product rule expansion of this term. So for this term over here, I've applied the derivative to phi. And for this term, I've applied the derivative to x. And when we apply the derivative to x, x just disappears. Because the derivative of a variable with respect to itself is just equal to 1. That's just a simple linear function. Now, let's have a look at what we can identify over here. These guys are the same. There's, there's a minus sign over here. So when we subtract these guys, that's just going to give 0. These guys cancel each other out. So what are we left with? Well, we have a minus sign over here. That minus sign came from over here, which I distributed to both of these terms. So that's going to give us minus h bar on i times phi. And what is that the same as? Well, this 1 over i, that's the same as minus i. So we can actually just move that upstairs and take away that minus sign. And that's going to leave us with i h bar, and then I'm going to write phi. And I'll write the x dependence over here. So have a look at what we found. We found that applying this commutator of x and p onto this test function phi of x gives us the test function with a multiplying factor at the front. So this multiplying factor, this i h bar, is actually the result of the commutator. So what do we do? I'll uh, underline this in green. This guy acting on the test function is the same as i h bar. So I can write that underneath. And that is a very important result. The commutator of position and momentum is equal to i h bar. Now, as we know in quantum mechanics, if there's an h bar, that means we're dealing with a quantum theory. h bar is a constant that appears everywhere. So this combination over here is very deep. And it's actually analogous to something you may have seen in classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, we have Poisson brackets. And Poisson brackets have a similar form to this. In Poisson brackets, we have these combinations of partial derivatives. So it's not like this, but it's a, an analogous formula. And Poisson brackets, we usually use those curly brackets to denote the Poisson bracket of two uh, quantities. And when we take the Poisson bracket of position and momentum, we usually get 1 if we're using the correct units. But over here, we're not getting 1. We're getting i h bar. And this is actually the constant that relates the Poisson bracket to the commutators. So what I want you to do is have a look at Poisson brackets and see how they're related to commutators. Those are the two analogous concepts. So Poisson brackets are the concepts of these deep symmetries and relationships that are present in classical mechanics. And commutators, these commutation relations, these guys are the deep uh, symmetric relationships that are present in quantum mechanics. And position and momentum 
they are going to keep showing up again and again in these videos in the quantum mechanics playlist. They're a very important relationship uh, between these guys. So one thing I want to do is in the beginning, I said I wanted to generalize to 3D. This is just 1D. So what I can also do is I can add some extra notation over here. I can say this guy, we'll put a little subscript. This guy is momentum in the x direction. So this is specifically for x and momentum in the x direction. What if I'm interested in other directions as well? What if I'm interested in y and z? I can write down a more general relationship. So I'll do that underneath. What we can do is we can take the commutator of, I'll put r over here just as a general coordinate, r with a little subscript i, and I'll put a little hat on top because we're dealing with an operator, and momentum, I'll put a little subscript i as well, and that i, so i can be x, it can be y, it can be z if we're dealing with Cartesian coordinates. And rx, that's just going to be x, ry, that's going to be y, rz is going to be z. And px, py, and pz are going to be the momenta in x, y, and z respectively. So these guys, they're also going to be i, h bar. But I can actually generalize this even further. So what if these guys are different? What if these indices are not the same? What if instead of i over here, what if instead I had j? I'll write that over here as well. So this is an even greater generalization. So this is a generalization that says that x and px give this value, y and py give this value, z and pz give this value. But what if we take a different value? What if we take uh, y and pz? What if we take this different index over here, this different, different subscript? So that's actually going to give us an even more general uh, version. And I'll write that over here. So that's going to be, let's say we have r hat. And I'll put i as the subscript over here. And for momentum, I'll put another subscript. This is a different subscript. We'll call that j. This is equal to i h bar. But it's not just i h bar. It's i h bar multiplied by the Kronecker delta symbol. So the Kronecker delta symbol is 0 when these guys are different, but 1 when these guys are the same. So i and j, again, so I'll write i and j can take on the values x, y, and z. And so what does this Kronecker delta tell us? It tells us that if these guys are the same, if i is equal to j, then we get a 1 over here. So this is i h bar. But if these guys are different, then we get a 0 over here. And that 0 just gets rid of this. So that means that if these indices are different, then we have commuting uh, operators. But they're not commutative if they're the same index. Why is that the case? Well, if we look back over here to these definitions, what we're dealing with are multiplying by the coordinate. Right? This could be x, y, or z. And over here, we're taking the derivative with respect to the coordinate. If it's the same. Uh, coordinate, if it's x over here and x over here, then differentiating and multiplying by the coordinate, well, that's going to matter. The, the order matters because of the product rule. So the order matters if these guys are the same. But if this was y or z instead of x, then the order wouldn't matter because the derivative is only differentiating with respect to that coordinate. So if we were to generalize this, as I said before, to partial derivatives, so I'll write that over here. So if we had partial derivatives, if we treated this as px is equal to, is defined as h bar on i, and then we would have a partial derivative with respect to x. Right? So this generalizes to a partial derivative. And if we had this partial derivative over here, the partial derivative does not care about y and z. It only cares about x. And the same is true for the other indices. If we have y over here, this partial derivative with respect to y is not going to care about x and z. So that means they commute. So you can move these guys around, and it just it's, it's the same thing. So that is the property of commutativity there. And that is why you have this relationship. So we started with these definitions for the operators. Right? This is something that we postulated in earlier videos in this playlist. But you can actually begin from these guys. You can start from the commutation relation. You can use these commutation relations as your building blocks to build up all of quantum mechanics and to actually derive these guys. So that's the reverse of the order that we did in this playlist. 
there's a lot of freedom into how you, you can actually axiomatize the, the entire system of quantum mechanics. So these guys can be thought of as being even more fundamental than these relationships that we started off with in the earlier videos in this playlist. So this is the most important point in this video. These kind of relationships are called the canonical commutation relations. So these guys are actually linked by the Fourier transform. And we'll find out what the Fourier transform is and how it relates to the position and the momentum. And the reason that these guys are linked in such a beautiful and elegant way is that they do not commute. When you take the commutator of x and px, it gives you ih bar. And when you generalize that to x, y, or z, you get this relationship over here. So this is known as the canonical commutation relation. And I want you to try and figure out the other versions of this. So try and write out uh, a version where you have y over here and maybe pz over here. And I want you to see that that would actually be zero because the indices are not the same. And it's not just because the indices are not the same. This is just a convention for the notation. The fundamental reason why that's the case is because we have derivatives with respect to a different coordinate. And you can swap the order uh, when you have partial derivatives and when you have uh, this kind of scenario over here. So if the partial derivative is not the same as the coordinate, those guys can be swapped around. That is the property of commutativity. We'll be looking at commutators in later videos, and we'll definitely be using this canonical commutation relation in proofs and derivations in later videos in the quantum mechanics playlist. You can find all those videos if you click over here in the quantum mechanics playlist.